Let's go back about 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point in time, you were a very well-known and respected director of commercials, having done something like 3,000 of them, I think, at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had recently completed your first feature film, The Duelist, which was very well received critically and won uh, honors at the Cannes Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And uh, then along came Alien, which was probably as far removed from your first film as, as you could likely get. Mm -hmm. uh, how was it that a science fiction horror film mm -hmm. came to you at this point in your career? And what was it about this particular project that made you want to do it? Uh, two questions. Uh, well, uh, uh, the, one of the producers, David Geiler, uh, was the, I think, uh, the, the person involved in uh, that choice because I think he'd seen the duelists at the Cannes Film Festival. And uh, they called up. So when I learned that uh, he'd asked me to do it because of the, the duelists, I was even more baffled than <laughs> anyone else. And the, so I guess it's all down to his good taste. <laughs> And the, um, the script was just so tight, concise. It was very spare. Uh, the characters were clearly defined, which frequently they aren't in that kind of exotic arena, in that kind of movie. You know, it's pretty waffly, and it's all down to you know, the effects and the horror and how horrible you can make it. What I liked were the characters, and I really loved the idea of uh, which was a f reasonably definitive new idea then of actually making the hero a woman. I thought that was really clever. Yes. Um, and it was a, just a very neat read. And I read the script in about an hour and a half and called him up within two hours and said, I'll do it. And so I was in, standing in Hollywood within, about, within 24 hours. <laughs> and so it was very tight. Um, the, whole, the dynamics of the screenplay which uh, also, I think, well, a lot of people miss or missed in the first screening of the film because the film has always been you know, criticized as being light on characterization, which I think is totally wrong. I think the, the characters were beautifully defined you know, within the context of all you had to know about them. Mm -hmm. you know, that's all you need to know. And I think the subtext to each character was really intelligent and gave you enough to know who was who. Right, you, the troublemakers were sure. Harry Dean and Yafid Koto down below, and the you know the upper deck of the upper echelon. You know, so you have a, a universal or classical uh, situation of um, of uh, you know separation of the of the classes even in space. Right. Yeah. What was your initial agenda when you first took over the project? I heard it was kind of in disarray. I understand that. Uh, yeah. It didn't have much direction at that point. Yeah. Coming in, I'd, I they'd already done a lot of preparatory stuff. I think with uh, Run. Cobb, right, and which was very good. In fact, Ron was ex was is brilliant. He's you know really one of the best at it. Um, and so we took him over to England anyway, because Ron does drawings and isometric visuals, which you know you can virtually put a sl in a slide rule on it and co cost it, right? Um, and everything works with Ron. He can tell you how the airlock's going to open and why it's there and how it why the door's got to be this way and that way. So he talks up a very interesting technical, um, you know, storm. Uh, so it was always fascinating to listen to him and listen to him speculate. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we kept him working with the production designer in England r almost for a year. Uh, the original visuals I saw were very, very good, and they were and a kind of a key, you know, where I started off, but. Uh, because I'm an art director, I was an art director. I decided it early on because the budget we got to the film originally was like four and a half million dollars, and I thought I had no idea perception of what four and a half million dollars meant in terms of it sounded like an awful lot of money to me, <laughs> and uh, so I sat down to prepare my own thoughts on it, and of course I storyboard everything, right? So I sat down basically storyboarded the movie. Um, and which produced a reaction of, you know, delight, but at the same time kind of horror because the costs suddenly started to look like they were rising. And so what we <coughs> did is we presented the board, I had to present the board to Fox. And then what, on, based on that we doubled the budget. So we went into 8-4 or something because uh, I think they started to feel that there was something here, hmm. right? Which was more than just a rip your head off and strangle them, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, 
but I bring all sorts of um, things to bear to it from the fact that I was a production designer and uh, I was uh, trained in art school, spent seven years in art, seven years in art school, spent four, three years at the Royal College of Art with, you know, serious colleagues like David Hockney, Alan Jones, Ron Kitai, painters like that, and some great graphic designers. So it's a very sophisticated arena that I came out of, but at that point. So I was able to take it further, I think, right? it's right. fair to say. Influenced certainly by um, 2001 and Star Wars. Because hmm. I'd seen Star Wars, uh, oh God, probably a month before I received the script. Hmm. Somebody said to me, let's go along and see this film called Star Wars. I don't know what the hell it's all about, but it's making a big fuss. It was the opening week and I went and saw that and of course I was stunned. I mean, I, I was absolutely devastated. I was de really depressed for a week uh, <laughs> that I was preparing Tristan the Soul on the one hand, which is fine, you know, but it's like walking into the lion's mouth doing a film like that. I mean, you're, gonna, you're never going to have a real audience for that. And it's still going to take a year of your life and, and I, I, back, I just dropped it and I decided I can't be doing this when this guy's doing that. And I can see that as fulfilling as doing Tristan and the Salt. So he really whetted my appetite, actually, Lucas. Mm. Right. Shortly before you released the film, mm -hmm. you cut 11 minutes out of it, mm -hmm. including a sequence at the end that yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, would have uh, talked mm -hmm. about what happened to the Harry Dean Stanton character and, yeah. and the uh, Tom mm -hmm. Skerritt character. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those yeah. scenes, what they entailed, and, and why you elected to cut them out. Well, you know, there's always a pace thing to a film, and uh, we cut the, we put it all together, you know, as shot, and um, the, nothing really happens for the first 45 minutes in the movie. But, you know, Jerry did a, a great score, so the whole anticipation of moving in right from the very first opening cue, which I think is absolutely magnificent, I still do. I still think it's one of the best cues. I've heard, you know, where you just, very simple scene, you're just panning across the planet, you know, and the titles, the great titles actually as well, mm -hmm. are coming up. And that is a great cue. And um, you just, from then on in, you, it's like entering the dark house, but in the best kind of way, you know. And uh, so the 45 minutes all stood up for me, but I know there was kind of a little bit of paranoia saying, God, nothing happens for 45 minutes. I'm saying, yeah, but look what you're looking at, you know, and you're looking at these, the, these guys awakening up. You're getting information all the time. Now, and I felt because we really got it, you know, we really got what it, it might be like, then it was powerful, right? Mm -hmm. So that all held position. But by the time we got to the dynamics of, you know, now she's on her own, right? Uh, we got a sense that the audience was getting restless at a certain point. And so when she stumbles into that room, which is the landing leg room, and finds this, you know, hive, um, and uh, she finds the bodies, basically, the nest. She finds the bodies and she finds um, Harry's gone, but he's clearly there and he's completely embedded in the surface in a kind of, uh, kind of, you know, strange, um, semi-glutinous, but very strong, uh, material, which is almost like built into fiberglass, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, Scarrett is already half gone, but he's still alive. He is really the host for the insect, mm -hmm. which is the alien.
I'll get you up to the shuttle. What can I do? There must be tricks of the trade to create suspense and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and terror. Uh, I presume your background in, in commercials probably kind of helped you mm -hmm. in the area of kind of manipulating your audience. Uh, you know what? The most important thing to do is not employ tricks. In, in, so in, in effect, if you're doing a horror movie, you know, is to, fig is to disregard the tricks that have been employed before because that's what you're doing, you're doing repetition. And so it's trying to always look back inside yourself, same as if you're writing a script, if you're writing a screenplay, if you're writing a book. You know, the best of those elements come from looking back inside yourself to find out what you think, you know, and then trying to put that on the film. So that's to do with being, how personal can you get when you're making a film, right. you know. What do you find personally frightening and, and were you able to incorporate that into the film? Well, I had to look into it. I mean, I had to look into it myself and say, oh, yeah, you know, what frightens me. Um, and um, so I started to look at a lot of uh, films, horror films, which were good ones. I think one of the great horror movies is The Exorcist. Yeah. So, and uh, we'd always talked and played around with the idea of, uh, you know, the absolutes of good and evil, right? And if the, the alien was really, what was it? Was it just, um, was it the face of the devil, right? Was it the face of the demon? Because if you look at historical, you know, manuscripts, engravings, pictures, uh, um, and from wherever they come from, whether it's China, whether it's Europe, whether it's, you know, whatever the nationality, there's a kind of continuity of mm -hmm. the idea, the perception of the, dem the demon, as there is about the dragon, right? So it's like taking off the mystical aspects of it and saying there's nothing to do with that. It's a Mar it's you know, Martians, Mars is not far enough away. It's it's a, a biological fact. It's a biological creature, and it's been here before. Exodus for me was the biggest lesson. Yeah. I just kept looking at it and looking at it, and um, looking at the class that you got involved making the movie. You know. Yeah. yeah. The uh, Alien was your second film. You've now done, I believe, six. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about it in retrospect? Uh, how does it stand up in, in your own mind? Alien. Alien. Wow. Well, you get so far separated from it now, you know, it's like you didn't make it. But yeah, yeah it's a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good film. Yeah. Very pleased with it. All right. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you.